Uh, it's a uh, uh, good morning to everyone and good evening to those who are uh, in the other part of the world. And this morning session, we have two very interesting talks. Uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the first speaker of today, Professor uh, Kuniko Kaneko from the University of Tokyo. Professor Kaneko is a well known uh, biophysicist who works on theoretical biophysics, uh, complex systems, biology, nonlinear dynamics. And today he is going to uh, talk about universal biology in adaptation and evolution, multi-level consistency, dimension reduction, and fluctuation response relationship. So Professor Kaniko, the screen is yours. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. And yeah, I hope to come back again to Bangalore. Yeah, I visited, uh, yeah, maybe five years ago or something. Yeah, and that was a great visit. So I hope to come back again, maybe next next year, I hope. So so today I talked about this topic and maybe people have not heard about the term universal biology. And so this is somewhat very much physicist or a macroscopic physicist type approach. So life system is a we consider some kind of universal class in nature. And so we try to make some kind of phenomenological theory to characterize general properties there. And so maybe in the future plan, we hope to make some kind of biology not restricted to those that happen to be evolved on this earth. So maybe in some other places like uh, some uh, Enceladus or uh, Europa, Hope. And also people are now making a, some kind of a artificial protocell uh, in laboratory. So maybe we hope to make uh, some theory that is common to all this. And actually this kind of ambitious field was proposed 50 years ago by a Japanese science fiction writer. And actually he's a great science fiction writer, uh, Kumasakyo. And according to his description, that is the novel at uh, 1968, and universal biology is a science to explore universal patterns and possible variations of living organisms in this cosmos. And it started to expand the end of the last century. So this field of this novel is the uh, 21st century. So that means the end of 20th century. And since then characterization of life in terms of topological geometry, and this is something like dynamical systems, according to the description of the novel, and has developed. And now grand theory comparable to relativity is anticipated. Mm, maybe not yet, <laughs> but, but we hope to do something to this direction. So that's why we started Universal Biology Institute in the real world. And that is launched uh, four years ago in University of Tokyo. And actually for today, talk in this universal biology approach, and we first start that life system consists of diverse components and that maintains itself and can continue to produce itself. So that is a very peculiar state in, from physicists view. But here, just reproduction is maybe simple, just crystal growth or something like that. But all life systems consist of many, many huge diverse components. So there are many, many components and they form, for example, cell and then cell reproduce. So from this picture, each component is a microscopic level and cell is macroscopic. And, but here, these state should be somewhat stable. And so to, for example, Okay, molecule replicates and cell reproduces. So it keeps some kind of consistency relationship. So that I'll discuss later. So from this consistency, we hope to make some kind of universal property or universal laws. So that's the intention of this uh, Universal Biology Institute. And actually we have worked on several topics and cell reproduction, adaptation, differentiation and evolution. And today, so mostly I talk about adaptation and evolution. And in the first part, uh, 
I focus on consistency between molecule level replication and cell level reproduction. And from that, uh, so even though there are huge diverse components, and so that means very, very high dimensional state originally, but there is some kind of dimensional reduction in phenotypic dynamics for a kind of stable yeah, state in the cell. And so that's the first part. So this is somewhat mostly response theory. And the second part is most focused on fluctuation. And so somehow fluctuation response relationship in evolution. And from these theories, so we expect that phenotypic evolution, even though genetic, so mutation is random, phenotypic evolution is quite directed and constrained. Uh, so that's the plan for this. And for the basic setup of this uh, theory or models, uh, so we consider phenotype and that is abundances of many, many components. So for example, in a cell, uh, you have 4,000 or 5,000 protein species or message RNA species. So that is uh, maybe 5,000 dimensional phenotypic space. So you have 5,000 dimension and this abundance, it gives a kind of phenotypic state. And genotype is, of course, given by DNA sequence. But according in the viewpoint of the theory, it gives the rule for this dynamics of this phenotype. So basically, you have many high dimensional dynamical system. And there is a rule to change this so to the govern the concentration. And that is given by so genes. And but then according to this phenotype, there is some selection and we have evolution. And so this kind of circulation. And then, so how genotype phenotype mapping is shaped. So is there some kind of yeah, characteristic in this mapping? So that's the yeah, intention. And we discuss a little bit about the experiment that is mostly transcriptome analysis of bacteria. And in the model, we use catalytic reaction network or gene regulation network. In both cases, there are, there are many, many components. So 1,000 dimensional or 5,000 dimensional dynamical systems. So that's the model. And we try to make a theory for that. So actually, uh, so here I start from a kind of trivial law in adaptation. So first, let us focus on steady growing cell. So that means after, so starting from cell, you have many, many components here and then grows and divide. And assuming that steady growth, these so abundances of many components are roughly same. So that means for this division, almost all components have to be roughly doubled. So if we consider this kind of exponential growth, that means, so if you consider there are M components, M proteins or something, and so the abundance is Ni, so each Ni increases with this rate. But this mu i should be equal. Otherwise, uh, this steady growth is not satisfied. So, but mu i is determined from all other components, basically. It's a, other, the function of other components. So that means mu i is a kind of a, some con function of this uh, m-dimensional phenotypic space. So that means if all mu i equal gives a m minus one constraints. So even though there are m dimensional state space, and then if we put this cell into some condition and then put some kind of, for example, stress and wait, it comes back to a kind of steady growth. So it's somehow adiabatically changing this state to a different environment. Then this should so be along a one dimensional line because there are n minus one conditions. 
So let us formulate this. So instead of considering the abundance, it's we consider concentration, that is the volume divided. And that volume of the cell increases with the mu, so exponential growing. So we focus on this exponential growing phase. Of course, this can be, so the growth is not completely this, but you can, so for example, oscillate, but then you can average out. So anyway, in this case, so now consider this concentration dynamics. So this is given some reaction. And then this growth, every component is diluted with this growth rate. So that's a very kind of simple yeah, equation. And now, instead of concentration itself, sometimes it's useful to take logarithmic of concentration. So here, I have to assume that the concentration is not zero. But anyway, if we assume that, so we can take x, and then if we take this, uh, this can be so written like this. So if I is just uh, divided with of this function. And then the steady state condition should be, so this should be zero. So that means if I equals mu. And actually this function itself depends on some other environmental condition. So, or stress, strength or something like that. So we have this equation parameterized by this environmental condition. And here, the left hand side, uh, left hand side has I, but this is independent. This is independent of. So that gives this M minus one conditions. So, so far very much trivial. And now, so we assume kind of linearization. So we start from a kind of original good state and put some stress and stress strength is given by E. And then, so linearization, so everybody, everything is linearized. And so original state, xi zero plus it goes xi. And so the difference is given by delta xi. So then, so we can write down this and gamma is just a kind of a, this derivative of phi divided by dE by stress condition. And so kind of susceptibility. And then this growth rate change. So since we linearize everything, so this should be proportional to some environmental stress. Then from that, we can simply, yeah, writing inverse matrix L and we can get this. So this is just simple linear algebra. And then we consider two different stresses and two different strength of stresses. So with different input and original state here. And, but this is given by the original state and the direction of this. So if you consider some kind of environmental stress for given environmental stress, then so this is a minus one dimensional state uh, line. And then we linearize this, something like that. And from that, so if we, this equation and divide it by this, this and this, then the last term is canceled out. So we can get this. So here again, this part depending on each component originally, but if after division, uh, this part is just the cell growth rate. So it's independent of J. So that means this is independent of J. So that's a simple kind of a yeah, consequence of steady growth and linearization. Now we can check this experimentally. So actually this is done by the group of Yomo's uh, laboratory. And what they did is put E. coli into a stressed condition. So originally in this state, and they measured all transcriptome. So that's uh, abundances of message RNA 
So there are 4,000 or something like that. And so this is my, my M dimensional, 4,000 dimensional space and originally Xi zero. And then after putting some kind of stress condition, it goes to Xi E. And if you put a little bit stronger, then it goes to Xi E prime. And then they can measure all transcriptome. And so that's this, okay, this is delta Xi and so this axis. So for example, in this case, so they put heat and this is medium heat and this is low, a little bit low heat. And so how we, they put delta Xi E over E prime for each component. So each circle is a different component or different message RNA. So there are roughly 4,000 points here, here. So the previous theory says that this should be, okay. this should be proportional or equal. This ratio is equal. It, it looks like, okay. So, and also the theory says that uh, this slope is given by the growth rate of the cell and they can measure the growth rate of the cell separately. And so this slope is given by delta mu, delta mu prime over delta mu E. So that agrees rather well. And this is another experiment for starvation stress. And this is, okay, another experiment by osmotic pressure in the case of osmotic pressure, there may be some deviation points. But recall that there are 4,000 points here. So most points are along this line and there are a few deviations. So, so far, okay. So one strange point here at this moment is that somehow linearization works too well because in this experiment, they originally put in a good state and the growth rate is something like that. And after they put, so okay, weak stress, medium stress, high stress for osmotic pressure or something like that. And sometimes the growth rate is 20% of the original. And they stop the experiment because uh, if you put too higher stress, then the st steady growth is difficult to be achieved. So up to that region, somehow linearization seems to work. So that's one strange point. The second point is that, okay, in the previous theory, we can compare only for the same type of stress and compare this. And actually this is uh, the equation in this gamma i depends on the each type of stress. And so if this type of stress is different, so we can, so this is different type of stress then we cannot divide. So we cannot cancel the out. So we cannot say anything according to the theory. And, but still we can plot the data. So for example, osmotic pressure versus starvation and heat versus starvation. And okay, the, so there are more scattering in the points. Still, it looks like not so bad. And actually the slope here is that uh, again, uh, estimated from the growth rate change. And so, okay, maybe this, uh, maybe somehow osmotic pressure makes yeah, a little bit deviation, but still most points here follow this line. So, so that's another mystery here because in the theory, they compare this corresponds to compare this and this. So I don't know why this can work rather well. So, I, and actually this is also true confirmed or better confirmed in protein expression changes. Uh, this is instead of message RNA. So Heinemann's group measured some kind of uh, yeah, protein and then 20 different conditions. And it looks like uh, for different condition, uh, this follows a linear relationship roughly. And this uh, slope uh, agrees 
with this growth rate and this. So now the mystery point is that large linear regime and validity across different environmental conditions. So in the original theory, we did not assume anything, only steady growth and linearization. So maybe we put something else in the theory. And of course, E. coli is a result of evolution. It's not just a high dimensional dynamical systems. So after evolution, so they may achieve this kind of state property. So now, so to consider that, we did some simulations. And actually, we can do, we can apply or use any models with many, many high dimensional dynamical systems. And according to this phenotypic high dimensional dynamical systems, some fitness for growth is determined. And then they select and the rule to govern this high dimensional dynamics is slightly mutated and select this. So we can check this using some reaction dynamics or uh, gene regulation network dynamics. And here, so I talk about the result of a simple catalytic reaction dynamics. And actually this model was originally did by Chikara Fuso and I, uh, about 20 years ago. And it has some good, good property, but yeah, we are not going to this. So basically you have thousand or many, many components here. And just consider random or specific reaction network and some X1, for example, goes to X5, catalyzed by some others. So that's all, all catalytic reactions. And so here, so all reactions are catalyzed by something else in this. So to, proce to process of this reaction process, so all catalytic components should be synthesized. And we put some kind of resource chemical. And so this is resource and in this figure, I put only one, but uh, there are, for example, 10 resource components, different species. And then, so this grows. And, and then if it works well, then the, so there is a flow of this resource chemical and then component grows. And then if the total number of molecules here is doubled, then we divide this cell into two. So we can repeat this process. And okay, so now, okay. Another thing is that we assume here kind of active transport. So for transport of this external component, there is some kind of transporter protein. So that is yeah, produced within and that catalyzes this. And for different components, maybe different components catalyze this. And then, so maybe if this works well, this cell can grow. And then we start from a different reaction networks originally randomly chosen, and then select those networks that have a higher growth and then repeat this process. And then for the division, we make a, some kind of slight mutation that gives a slight change of this network. And then again, select this higher growth one. And by doing this, so originally this growth rate and this from the random network, so the growth rate is not so high. And then after many generations, this growth rate increases. And here in this environmental condition, there are 10 components and every components are equal concentration. And after making this, we part up this environmental condition. So we put some kind of stress. So that is given but uh, by this change of this external concentration. So original vector and put some kind of or original vector and put some kind of part up uh, different direction. So this uh, uh, different conditions is 10 dimensional. And we have a strength, strength here. And then, so we can have a situation that we can compare how all components, actually logarithmic change of this component. So I equals one simulation. 
person. And then we can consider on some kind of environmental stress. And then again, a different environmental stress, different vector here. And compare these thousand components as in this experiment. So we can do the similar thing. So is this clear, I hope? And then, so this is the plot here for different environmental condition, one example. And actually this blue point is this initial random network. So there is no correlation. But after evolution, 150 generation here, you can see clear yeah, relationship. And we did many, many different environmental conditions. And originally there is uh, so no correlation. So this is correlation coefficient. And we did many experiments, numerical experiments and histogram of this correlation coefficient. And after evolution that is close to one, so 0 0.9 or something. So this kind of proportionality is shaped. So, so we, can somehow understand this experimental result. But then we can ask why, how this kind of correlation is shaped. And in this case, so since we know every component, we can make kind of principal component analysis of all components. So get that side. And then here, so put this, now each point is this, okay, we consider this uh, 5,000 uh, dimensional to take just three principal components here in this change, this all changes across different environmental conditions. So we may like, make many, many different, yeah, environmental vectors and many different environmental conditions. And then, so many for each point, it corresponds to a different environmental condition now. Now each point is a different environmental condition. And so each yeah, principal component states of all these 5,000 uh, dimensional state space. Now after evolution, you can see some kind of roughly one dimensional structure. So anyway, it's very much low dimension, but originally, this is very much high dimensional. So this is start of this random network and there is no structure at all. So after evolution, this kind of one dimensional, low dimensional structure is evolved. And actually this line, so this is a point for across different environmental condition, but this is also true for starting from this given condition and put some kind of mutation Mutation means that put a slight change in the network. And then different state. And again, this follows the same manifold. So this grade is the original due to this environmental variation. So this follows the same line. And actually by putting some noise, it follows again the same, yeah. Line. So from this picture, we can propose a kind of, so dominant mode hypothesis or something like that. So consider a cell state, so very high dimensional state, but after evolution, it should be a kind of fitted state. Then in this original dynamics, it's very much stochastic. I forget to say that this model so I used just stochastic reaction dynamics. So instead of ordinary differential equation, we put some kind of a, yeah, just a random reaction process, choose components and stochastic GSP or some other methods. And then, so it should be many, many, there should be exist many, many perturbations, noise perturbations. But this, as long as this state is good, and this good state is, should be may, very much rare in the high dimensional state. Then after perturbation, it should come back. So maybe robustness to noise exists. So that means 
this should be attracted from many, many dimensional state very fast. Otherwise, it can go away to a different bad state. So, so that's one property. But this state has evolved or is evolving. So maybe originally here and evolving here, evolving here. Uh, along this evolutionary direction, the state should change. If it's too stable, uh, if this state is too stable and it's attracted to any directions very fast, there is no way to evolve. So along the direction of evolution, this should be easier to change. And all other states are very strongly attractive. So this picture, so it's kind of robustness plasticity picture is consistent with this uh, numerical evolution experiments and also this. And if we assume this, we can rely to the previous theory. Instead of this, so we have, yeah, maybe thousand dimensional this, but only for this, the one mode is very, so slowly changing and the other is very fastly relaxing. So if we consider the inverse of L, then one mode is dominant and the other is very close to zero, inverse of J. And then only this dominant mode should be considered. So we can project everything to this here dominant mode, W cell. And then basically you can consider instead of a thousand dimension, only consider just one mode and everything is uh, so projected to one mode. And then from some kind of uh, yeah, linear algebra calculation, we can derive this. So across E is a different type of stresses, different type of environmental condition, but it's basically given by this growth rate change. So that is consistent. So far, okay, good. And actually we checked this kind of separation of the slowest or mode uh, by using catalytic reaction network model, but instead of using ordinary differential equation here. And then, so this is this Jacobi matrix and this inverse of this eigenvalue. And if you have thousand and then thousand eigenvalues, and here is a plot of this all eigenvalues. And then as this evolution progresses, one mode goes to this. So the inverse is large. So that is the mode, this eigenvalue of the originally of J is close to zero and compared with all others. And according to this, so eigen mode, so all change in, for example, in the PC change, principal component changes is roughly aligned. So this is the so kind of a inner product of this uh, eigen mode and this principal component. And this goes to close to, okay, one point zero. So, so far, this is okay. Now, recall that phenotypic change due to environment variation and genetic change follows the same line. So we can apply this theory of this E. So instead of two different environmental conditions, we can compare environmental change versus genetic change, environmental change versus evolution. So we can relate this formulation again, and then we can do environmental change and G is genetic change, so evolutionary genetic change. And we can relate this and according to this kind of a, yeah, assumption we can easily derive this. So instead of two different environmental condition, environmental condition versus genetic change condition, evolutionary condition change. So now consider a situation, we put some stress to this system and then evolve this system. So we put a new stress and then make a kind of wait for some time to evolve, to adapt to this new environmental condition. Then this shows genetic change. 
So we can check this. And in this case, so originally good state, and then put some kind of stress. There is negative delta mu e. And then after evolution, it recovers. So this should be smaller. So that means, okay, this should be less than one. So that means after putting some kind of environmental condition, environmental stress, so every component changes, but after evolution, this change is reduced, almost proportional to all components. So this is a somewhat a little bit similar to the Chatelier principle. So after, so later, this original change is reduced. So we can check this experimentally. So this is the experiment by Chikara Fursa's group. And they put, so E. coli into a stressed condition, in this case, so ethanol stress or something like that. So originally growth rate is here and they put some stress. So this uh, growth rate is reduced to from here to here. And then they evolve this evolution experiment over yeah, thousand generations here. And then the growth rate is recovered. And so they check, they sample some generation at some generation and they measure all transcript flow across all components. So that's similarly we did previously. And then again, plot here, this delta xi e versus delta xi g, genetic change. And this is the plot. And yeah, most points are along this line. There are some scattering points here. But still here, you have 4,000 points. So actually maybe three, 1,000, 2,000 points are along this line. And so we can measure this slope. And according to this theory, this slope change, slope is proportional to this. And so we sampled this and this and this and this and this and this and, this and compare this here. So each point is at for different generations. And the theory says that this should be along this and there is no fitting parameters, so this should be equal. And so, okay, this is basically in this diagonal line. So it looks like, okay. And furthermore, it's interesting. They measured, they put, plotted the, train, the principal component analysis according along this change. And so this principal component one, two, three, and then this original state and evolution occurs like this. So this is a different generation. And they repeat this experiment many times, or actually five or 10 times or here, maybe six, seven times or something. All the experiments follow the same curve. And actually the mutation for different experiments are different. Mutation sites are different. Still, phenotypically, they follow the same line. So in some sense, replaying, replaying the tape of evolution, maybe genetically it's different, but same phenotypic path they follow. So that's an interesting point in this experiment. And we can do the numerical uh, simulation also. And in the previous model, uh, after growing to this, they put some kind of very different stress, different environmental condition, and then the growth rate decreases. And then we make another, again, a new set of evolution from here, then it's recovered. And then we can do the same thing. So check this point and check this point and this how this growth rate change delta mu E and compare with this delta mu G. And then according to this thousand point and maybe after maybe five generations, this follows this. And then this is 10 generation and this is 50 generation. So they follow the basically single slope and this slope and versus the uh, growth rate change. So agrees rather well. So, okay. 
So, and also we can do this uh, experiment and repeatedly. And then, so initially here, so after revolution here, and then putting stress and we repeat this and then we put again the different principal components that in a similar way in this experiment. Again, they follow the same curve. Okay, this is true. Only we start from the evolved network. If we start from a random network, this just diverges in this principal component. And here they follow the same curve. And actually in this case, so, they use the already evolved slow manifold, low dimensional manifold. And they use this low dimensional manifold for the next evolution. So that's how this evolution is constrained and they follow the same deterministic path. So, so, so far the first part, okay. I suppose 40 minutes already. <laughs> okay, cellular phenotypes are high dimensional but the adaptive change are drastically restricted into a low dimensional one dimensional manifold. And phenotypic evolution is rather deterministic, even though genetic changes can be stochastic. And then, so, so far, kind of deterministic part and response, we consider only response. But actually, each component abundance of transcriptome of each cell is not completely identical, even though they use the same gene cells. There is large fluctuations as recent studies demonstrated. So we can discuss the fluctuation also. And so physicists know that fluctuation and response are somehow tightly correlated according to the yeah, Einstein's theory, but of course, if we can apply this kind of argument to the cell, that is not clear, but maybe we can kind of think of this. So previously we saw we discussed response by environment and response by evolution, that is proportional. So now we can discuss fluctuation by environmental change or by noise and fluctuation by genetic change. And if these are proportional or these two are related, and actually we started this a uh, little bit long, uh, maybe 15 years ago or a, a little bit more. And the first we found some kind of evolutionary fluctuation response relationship. And that is a little bit old stuff. And this is 2003 papers. And what in this experiment, uh, this group of people did, they put E. coli, some kind of fluorescence protein. And this fluorescence originally is not so good. And this is fluorescence level, originally this level. And even though they take same gene bacteria and they make uh, some clones and thousand or more, 10,000 clones or something, fluorescence is not identical. So it's distributed or fluorescence concentration is distributed. And then so they make mutation to this original one. And some are, have a higher fluorescence, some have a lower, and some have a higher. And they select the highest fluorescent one, and that is this. And then again, they select highest one from this and repeat this experiment. So the fluorescence increases. And, but each case, there is fluctuation. This fluctuation is not due to genetic change this same clone for this mutant. And this, and you can see that this evolutionary step, increase of the fluorescence decreases. And also this variance decreases. And actually they measured, we measured the evolution speed. So the increase of this average, yeah, fluorescence per generation, this axis, and variance at each generation. And this is a red point about this black one. So this seems to follow some kind of linear relationship. And actually we did a similar thing 
for the cell model I, we previously mentioned. And again, in this case, so given for given mutation rate, so is so originally this is a, has high fluctuation and high evolution speed, and this de decreases through his evolution. And both decrease in proportion. So, so in some sense, this is a little bit similar to fluctuation response relationship. And the fluctuation response relationship, of course, you know, as you know, response is a kind of shift of some variable by force, and fluctuation is without force. And this is proportional uh, in the thermal equilibrium yeah, formulation. In this experiment, of course, it's not equilibrium, thermal equilibrium, but this fluctuation here is without genetic change. And response, response is the evolution speed, and they put some kind of genetic change and then select this one. So some kind of kind of selection force by putting mutation. And this is without force and without mutation, this is proportional. So somehow mathematically a little bit similar. And we can formulate this kind of a distribution of a, uh, some concentration or a phenotype and controlled by some kind of parameter. So that is control parameter is a kind of jet parameter. And assuming that this is a Gaussian or something like that, we can derive this. So with some kind of this calculation. But of course, this here, we assume that kind of some linear relationship or linear small change or something like that. So this is based on assumption. But still, it looks like, OK, according to the simulation, this works rather well. Now, so 2003, we are a bit happy. But then there is another mystery. There is famous theorem in population genetics or evolution theory that is according to Fisher. And Fisher says evolution speed is proportional to VG. And VG is the phenotypic variance due to genetic change. So VG is that you have a different genes. So for each gene, they have a different phenotype. So if gene is distributed, then according to this distribution is mapped to phenotypic value distribution. And this variance is given by VG. And so this VG is proportional to evolution speed. This is somewhat intuitively clear because after, so the, for the next generation, they use the same gene. So they start from this. So if this is highly distributed, then kind of step is larger. So if we select this side, so it can grow, it can have a higher speed. So VG's proportional to evolution speed is somewhat natural. And so this is called as a fundamental theorem of natural selection. But what we found is that not VG, we called isogenic, isogenic uh, variants, isogenic phenotypic variants. So they have same gene, but due to noise in the process, this is distributed. And the variance of this. And what we found is that this is evolution speed. So that to be consistent with Fisher's theorem, this and this should be proportional. And this is actually not so trivial because this is due to just noise in the process. And this is mutation. And then we checked in this model and actually this is VIP and VG and through this evolution, this follows the same line. Okay, so this looks fine. And then if we increase the mutation rate Mutation rate means that the mapping, so this distribution increases because genetic chain variance is increased. So 
if we increase the mutation rate, this slope increases this Fuji. And then basically evolution speed increases. But if we increase too much, too higher mutation rate, then suddenly the distribution of this phenotype collapses. So here mutation rate is increasing. And this is the distribution of a fitness or phenotype. And then with this increases, and then at some threshold value, this distribution becomes basically flat. So following this, we make some kind of very much phenomenological theory. So assuming that phenotype X or fitness or the genotype. And previously, genotype is a parameter. And so we consider the distribution parameterized this. But now for the moment, assuming that this is just a kind of variable and treat these variable distribution. And then we put some kind of stable evolution hypothesis through the course of evolution, this distribution should keep a single peak structure in this uh, so genetic space and phenotypic space, X, A. So then that means we can consider some kind of Hessian condition of this distribution should be stable. So for example, consider the case of this a uh, phenotypic variable and mutation or genetic change, A, and some coupling here. And then from this, we can derive this. And so the stability condition means this should be a uh, negative and that gives some kind of constraint that mutation rate. So that corresponds to the maximal mutation rate for the stability. And by using this, and assuming that mutation rate is not so large, then we can some make some calculation and this VG is proportion have this. And then from this calculation, assuming that mutation rate is not so large, we can derive this. So from that, this means that this for given mutation rate, this and this is proportional. So, so we can somehow explain that we need some kind of phenomenological <laughs> assumption, but then, so we can derive this. Okay, we have this kind of relationship. Okay, but still one may wonder, this means it's better to have some kind of phenotypic variance to be stable because yeah, if this, okay, this should be something because if mu is larger than mu maximum, uh, then this relationship is broken down and it, this distribution collapses. So why is it better to have a kind of phenotypic distribution large? So in some sense, it's better to have a large noise in this original dynamics. So we did some kind of gene expression dynamics model. We don't have time, so we just uh, skip the details. But anyway, we consider some kind of gene expression dynamics model that is similar to some neural network or some other model activation, repression, mutual network, and assume that according to this dynamics, there is noise. And then we put some kind of fitness condition. Fitness condition is that, so some 10, 10 genes should be expressed or something like that. So in some sense, so that means, so if you have just two components starting from this originally known expressed state, it's better to have, so these should be expressed. If it's not expressed at all, then it's bad. If only one component is expressed, maybe it's half and this is better. So we have 10 components and evolve this network. And we did check the previous uh, uh, result. And actually, if the noise in this model is sufficient to be large, then we see all the expected result. So this VIP, that is 
the variance due to noise and variance due to genetic change. This follows the linear relationship and decreases, and this is larger. And so it's really close, uh, this follows. And actually, if the noise is too small, then this kind of evolution does not progress. So we can discuss why this is so. In this model, so it should go to a good state, but this is very much noisy again. So this path should be stable against so noise. If there is sufficient noise, if there is no noise or very weak noise, you can choose any path. It goes from here, any dynamics to go from here to here, even though there may be, so after some noise, it may be divert, right? Then, so probably if this evolution occurs to have some kind of robustness, this should satisfy this kind of property. So as this robustness to noise increases, this kind of structure is selected. And then if this kind of structure is selected, then consider some kind of mutation. Genetic change alters some kind of dynamical process a little bit, but still it can come close along this original line because there is strong attraction here. So in some sense, robustness noise leads to robustness to mutation. And if robustness to noise increases, then this variance decreases. Robustness to noise, then this decreases. Then robustness to noise increases the robustness to mutation. Then this also decreases. So we you cannot prove this should be proportional, but maybe you can see some kind of correlation. So that's how this process occurs. And okay, I don't have time, but we can discuss this kind of variance of due to noise and due to genetic change for each component. And from that, we can derive that each for each component, across each component, this should be yeah proportional. And this can be derived. Okay, so maybe three more minutes. So maybe we discuss this kind of macroscopic theory for adaptation and evolution. And some, some kind of dimensional reduction leads to some kind of general strong constraint in adaptation and evolution and directed evolution. So maybe we need some kind of further confirmation by experiments. We did some experiments and Chikara did some kind of nice evolution experiments. So, but we need a little bit more. And also we did some model studies and okay, we confirmed this in catalytic reaction networks and this high dimensional catalytic reaction network and gene regulation network. And this, uh, we did something before and also there is some kind of archive. And actually we, to go to some kind of statistical physics theory we consider kind of spin Hamiltonian system, JIJ, given by JIJ, and to achieve certain configuration of spin and under some thermal noise. And then we have seen some kind of similar dimensional reduction. And this is somehow related to replica symmetric phase in this, according to this spin glass model. So that's one direction. So. And another reaction, okay, we discussed only cells, but maybe in the protein, protein itself is a very high dimensional dynamical systems. And then we can discuss a similar thing in protein model or data. And that is recently given by uh, so Dr. Tan. And in this case, so critical state to satisfy robustness and plasticity and some kind of power of behavior in this spectrum are observed. So that's, so we need to do. And also, okay, maybe this is good. And so maybe related issues. So we start from genotype and phenotype. Gene is a rule and phenotype is some kind of dynamics determined by the rule. 
So that is consistent with the central dogma in molecular biology. So gene determines the information to produce this dynamics and protein uh, is a kind of function. So there's information and function symmetry breaking. So information is given by DNA, function is given by so enzyme or protein. And actually recently we discussed by using multi-level evolution theory uh, that this kind of symmetry breaking, this kind of separation occurs as a result of symmetry breaking. So that's how this kind of separation occurs. And another point we discussed is, we are discussing is that so far we discuss uh, agreement in evolution and adaptation. Only the final state, final steady state. But through the course, so this final good state is achieved as a result of developmental dynamics, especially in multicellular organism. We have so dynamical systems of many cells. And then it's shaped the final state. Then the evolution also progresses, originally not good state, and finally it good state. So the next step is the correspondence between the final state, instead of the correspondence between the final steady state, there is correspondence between the path in evolution and path in development. And actually, Kosokabe did some simulation for this to produce some kind of, yeah, some specific stripe patterns. So this is space. And then initially there is no stripe. And then through this development, this stripe is formed. And then we can check how this evolution progressed to make this kind of stripes. And it looks like this this agree rather well how to yeah diversify how to make a different threads and so actually we can discuss how why this kind of agreement occurs in terms of this kind of again low dimensional reduction and finally maybe another point so far we discussed only steady growth but in a bacteria in a bad state, this steady growth is broken and they go to a kind of dormant state or stationary state. And that in that case, so the exponential growth is not observed. And we had some theory for how this transition occurs. And then maybe the next question is this kind of low dimensional reduction theory can be applied to this. Or maybe another possibility is as Tolstoy said, in Anna Karenina's uh, fiction, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So maybe happy cells are all alike in low dimensional state, but maybe unhappy cells may be in unhappy in its own way. Maybe they are, maybe high dimension. So that, that's another direction for the future. Okay, so maybe if you speak and so, summary, so low dimensional structure for this robustness, robust phenotypic state. And from this kind of argument, we can derive universal law for adaptation and evolutionary law or fluctuation law also. So that's all, thank you. So any Thank you, questions? Professor Kaneko. Uh, yeah. Wonderful uh, talk. And I believe uh, there are questions from the audience. So if anyone has question, please go ahead. Uh, Raja, I have a question. Yes, this is the yes, question. Yes. Uh, uh, Kuni, the, my question is that in the linear part, you yeah. have linear response coefficients. Yeah. So is there some analog of Onsega reciprocity relation, relation uh, for these uh, linear response coefficients? That's a very interesting question. And actually, we, uh, so actually, Chikara Furusawa is working on some kind of evolution experiment across many, many different, for example, into many different antibiotics. 
mm -hmm. and put some kind of antibiotics and then evolution occurs. And so, and put a different environmental condition, it goes, uh, yeah, so many different antibiotics. And then, then, so they can check if this uh, evolutionary direction, and if, for, for example, if one is strong, if one bacteria is strong to mm -hmm. one type of antibiotics, and if it is stronger to antibiotics B, or sometimes weaker. And Onsaga respiratory says, so if, anti, if this evolution occurs for stronger antibiotics A, then it means, and if it's also stronger to B, then if you evolve B under B, it's also stronger to A. Or if it's negative, if A evolved in under A, and if it's weaker to B, then that means if evolve into B, then it's also weaker to A. And it looks like it's not always true. <laughs> oh, I see, okay. But, but it seems that there is uh, this, yeah, agreement occurs more often. So there is some exception, but it looks like there is some, yeah, possibility. Or maybe we can, this, this argument is too simple. So we, we, we need to, yeah, generalize this original theory to make this kind of, to adapt to this kind of condition. And so for example, that is very important for the trade-off to evolution to antibiotics. And that is uh, also, yeah, important for application because uh, if they put some antibiotics and then if this bacteria is stronger to other, yeah, yeah, conditions or not, that is uh, very important for yeah, empirically or application. So this kind of trade-off uh, condition they are now making, and actually there is a very nice paper by Chikara Fusawa's group of this uh, evolution experiment across many, many, many different antibiotics uh, that's uh, published very recently in Nature Communication. This is pure experiment so far, yeah. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. Anyone wants to ask a question from the audience? Maybe I ask a question. Uh, um, uh, so I was wondering, I mean, uh, in your uh, 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 stochastic reactions uh, and the, the first part of your talk, you proposed this. So I was wondering uh, whether uh, the stress uh, somehow affect the uh, intake of the nutrients. I mean, the, or the nutrients is sort of remains completely un unaffected uh, by the stress that you have incorporated. Oh, actually, so this external nutrients here. So environmental condition is given by external concentration. And this is transported into this. So then within this cell, it's a kind of internal variable. Okay. So this 10 component. And so they have to keep some kind of, uh, yeah, relevant, yeah, con concentrations to, to, for this good cell growth. And okay. actually previously, yeah, we did that this, in this case, abundances of many, many components, average abundances of these thousand components follow the kind of power law distribution. So you have, a, so some components is very much and the second component is not so much. So this is a rank of abundances uh, in all components and this abundance is and this is log log growth. Log abundances versus log rank follows minus one. Yeah. All right. And that is some kind of deep so and that is true in the real cell also. So I mean this model is specific to any cell type or it can be applied to uh, in general many uh, cell types or I mean, okay. Actually, in this simple model, there is no cell differentiation. Right. So we need to have a, a little bit higher nonlinearity to have cell differentiation. And actually, 
that's we did uh, actually 90, 90s, 94, 98, 90, something. And in that case, so we studied some kind of a reaction dynamics of us. So cell and sometimes 10 components or any components. And then we found if this cell abundance is initially oscillate, then as this cell number increases and this cell cell interacts, this makes some kind of spontaneous differentiation mm. to differentiated states. And differentiated states lose this oscillation. And that seems to be consistent with some experiments. And if this is true, ES state, every embryonic stem cell state or stem cell state needs some kind of oscillatory paths. And then differentiation that loses this oscillation. But of course, this oscillation includes some kind of stochastic part. So, so as Sasai san yesterday showed that, of course, it can show very much stochastic, but there is also oscillatory part, circulation part. So that, that's a totally different story. Yeah, that's <laughs> and that's, uh, yeah. So if you are interested in, you, you can see some paper by Fusa and myself and- Okay. 2000. Okay. And also, there is a science paper we did in 2012. Yeah. So you can see a very rough introduction. Yeah. Thank you. Can I, can I ask uh, another? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. You see, you define the response coefficients. Uh, so, and you had some control parameters. Is there mm -hmm. any regime where, you know, this response coefficient is likely to diverge, indicating existence of some kind of criticality? Uh, so you mean the so so the original part the first part so this uh, coefficient so so this low dimensional structure works as long as this exponential growth is working and there is no yeah kind of divergence or some kind of critical mm. but but actually so. Then the question is that, so in this experiment, they only studied the case that steady growth is assured. And mm -hmm. if you put too high stresses, then this steady growth is broken. And in that case, so maybe, so we need to some theory for no exponential growth. So that is some kind of transition, phase transition, exponential growth to no exponential growth. And then in that case, so response maybe, so that's, uh, that's maybe we cannot have, a, so probably we cannot have clear low dimensional structure. That's, uh, that's uh, I, I said this under Karenina hypothesis, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and actually we did a simple model for this kind of transition, but this is so far just few components. This mm. component A, component B and complex of this. So basically it's three component model. And still we can show the phase transition as this uh, so kind of a exponential growth. So this is a growth rate and this external environmental or nutrient concentration. And there is some kind of transition at this kind of air concentration. And then this is the kind of transition. But so far, we did the model only for just three components. Mm. So if we do a similar model for many, many components, we can see some kind of a phase transition. And then we can see some kind of critical within here. here. So, so that, that's a very interesting, yeah, future direction. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question from the audience? I have a question. Uh, my name is Vaidehi, and uh, 
Uh, I have a, I'm out of this field. <laughs> I work on yeah, protein actually, dynamic, but I have, out of yeah, <laughs> but I just wanted to uh, ask, maybe this is a very naive question. Um, right. So can you simulate or can you identify the transition of a mammalian cell from a normal cell to a cancerous cell? And if so, what are the genes that are uh, subjected to the stress that you know, allow this transition to happen? Uh -huh. So that's a, that's a little bit different. So this is a, so it's a previous, the previous you, question. You were talking about yeah, genotype and phenotype. So I was thinking whether you could. Yeah. So previous question said that uh, some kind of a, so different cell differentiation. And so actually we did the model of this cell differentiation of multi-cell organism. And then, so as I said that maybe we don't have the paper, uh, slide for that, but anyway, no, we don't have the slides. But uh, anyway, so if we have some kind of, uh, yeah, so some, some dimensional phenotypic space of this gene expression model, and we did some kind of gene expression dynamics model. And then mm -hmm. originally we have some kind of oscillatory state. And then as the cell number increases and differentiate, then cells start to differentiate and this goes to a different state. And then maybe further differentiated states. So we can see that's kind of normal cell differentiation process. And then in this model, if this is a very much high dimensional, there can be another state, another possible state that can grow. And then probably this may be a cancer state. And the reason why I say this may be a cancer state is that all other state, these are differentiated to satisfy mutual yeah, relationship. So I said that consistency between molecule and cell, but in this case, case consistency between cell and multicellular state. So ensemble of cell, different cell types. So mm -hmm. each cell type distribution is so within some, some should be robust. But this state is some kind of selfish cell. And so it can grow by itself and there's no, no good relationship with the others. So in some sense, this looks like a cancer state. And another interesting point is that this state should be robust and robust to noise. And as I said, robust noise, and this also leads to robustness to mutation. Mutations. But this state is, does not appear through the course of evolution. So this does not need to be robust. So actually this state is not robust to noise. And this means not robust to mutation. So this can easily accumulate mutation to achieve higher robustness. So then cancer state can easily accumulate mutations. So mm -hmm. originally maybe it occurs as a kind of phenotypic state. So maybe it's a kind of cancer stem cell state. And then it can easily accumulate and mutation and stabilize and grows faster. So so that's so far the view of cancer from this picture. But, but this is <laughs> still no, no experiment, no direct experiment. If you are interested, mm -hmm. uh, I wrote a kind of, uh, yeah, this hypothesis in the paper by USA. I think okay. 2012 or something like that too, too. I forget 2012. Okay. I'll look something. it up. So if you are interested, yeah, please. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Because if Thank we you. can predict the, you know, the pre-neoplastic state of yeah. what are the genes that promote yeah. these transitions, that would be really uh, clinically very relevant. Yeah, actually in this kind of study, so this is somewhat <laughs> abstract. So we cannot say, 
okay, which gene is deviated from this <laughs> relationship? We cannot predict that. So no, I was a, just thinking yeah, about limit. the gene uh, mutations, right? Like which oh, yeah. mutations are causative to can yeah. precancerous state. That's yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any other question from the audience? Yeah, I, I have a question. So uh, this is Sean here. May, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. Um, so um, when you add um, sort of low levels of antibiotic and the stress levels are low in the cells, um, let's say you still have exponential growth at the population level. Um, uh -huh. Does it necessarily mean that at the level of individual proteins, you also have steady state growth or uh, increase in these protein levels at, with the same growth rates? Because I think that's an underlying assumption you made in your theory, right? Yeah. So maybe maybe I, I made a kind of confusing com comments. All these kind of exponential growth uh, theory and comparison with the experiments is done by some kind of a external stresses other than antibiotics. So put mm -hmm. some kind of a, yeah, heat or osmotic pressure or starvation. So that's kind of continuously changing. And up to that critical level, they keep kind of exponential growth. So as long as it's satisfied within this region, so mm -hmm. here, so up to this growth rate decrease up to so this is original the 20% or something. Mm -hmm. So so up to that level, so there is kind of steady growth. And this theory so far can work only for that. So mm -hmm. if it goes to a kind of a very really bad state, non-exponential growth, and uh, then this kind of theory is not directly applied. Mm -hmm. So that's a kind of yeah. challenge to- yeah. well, I think yeah. What I meant is at the population level, so when you're looking at the total number of cells as a function of time, that yeah. is still exponential, whatever your stress conditions are. But yeah. could it be that at the level of the proteins, if they are not individually growing at some kind of steady state growth um, with some exponent uh, growth rate or something? Uh -huh. so even, yeah, so my question is, even though the population is growing at a steady state, uh -huh. exponential growth, uh -huh. does it necessarily mean that the underlying components of the cell uh -huh. are also growing in a steady state fashion? Okay, that's actually, in this experiment, they are very careful to choose such kind of steady growth state. Hmm. So right. that this original, so basically, after cell division, so the same concentration of each protein mm -hmm. is somehow satisfied. Mm -hmm. But of course, there is fluctuation. Mm -hmm. So fluctuation is fine. Right, sure. So, yeah. So the average, and then in a bad, if you have a higher stress, then this fluctuation increases, probably. Mm -hmm. And then this, uh, yeah, variance increases. So th that's uh, somewhat related to, to the second part of this, uh, how so this state has a higher fluctuation and so, and if you put some kind of stress, mm -hmm. this may have a higher fluctuation. Mm -hmm. And then, so yeah, but still we need to assume that this kind of steady, so there is some kind of average concentration versus fluctuation. Mm -hmm. So if you have a state that mm -hmm. So maybe in a really bad state, maybe you have a kind of, yeah, double peak distribution. Mm -hmm. Then this theory cannot be applied mm -hmm. or we need to extend the theory to have a yeah, double peak or so yeah, right. basically. Mm -hmm. So maybe in this sense, so we are still in the state of ideal gas. So we don't go to the theory of this yeah, phase transition yet. <laughs> Okay, thank you, thank you very yeah. much. So that's a very important challenge to the next step, I think. Any other question, a uh, quick question from the audience? If, if that is not the case, then let's uh, thank Professor Kaniko for this yeah. wonderful talk and then uh, the extensive discussion. 
Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Kuni, for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.